This is Reimagining Higher Education, your go-to podcast with remarkable education leaders sharing personal stories from their experience in and around the sector, including reflection and hope for progress in the sector. With your host, Professor Judith Sachs, former PVC Learning and Teaching at the University of Sydney, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost at Macquarie University, and Special Advisor in Higher Education at KPMG, and now Chief Academic Officer at Studiosity. Welcome. I wish to acknowledge that I am talking to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. And we respect their knowledges, experiences, and the contribution they've made to civilization and life over many millennia. Today, I'm talking to Professor Steve Chapman, Vice-Chancellor from Edith Cowan University. I'm going to go a little bit off script today, and I'm going to ask Steve to talk to us about how he would introduce himself. Over to you. Thank you, Judith and Kaya. I'm coming to you from the uh, lands of the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation here in Perth, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, how would I introduce myself? Uh, I guess I identify as a chemist. That was my training. That's my love. Um, but in terms of what I do, I identify myself as a vice chancellor. Um, as a person, I would like to think I'm the type of person you would like to go down to the pub with, have a beer, and just chat about what's going on in the world today. So you've, you failed to indicate that this is your second vice chancellorship. So yes. you, you, you do know the ropes. So I'll, I'll follow up on the, those sort of comparing uh, sure. a university uh, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, Yes. Uh, that probably has lived in the shadows a bit of the University of Edinburgh, but has cast a very different place for itself. You made a great difference there. Um, my spies tell me that you are a wonderful vice chancellor to work with. So it's nice to know you must have good spies. <laughs> I do. I do. And um, so it, I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation today. So can you show me the, um, the object that you've brought and, and talk to me about it? It's, periodic table. <laughs> it's a periodic okay. table of the elements. I've from a from a small child getting my I think in those days health and safety wasn't as stringent as it is now, and you could get a very good chemistry set with all kinds of stuff when you were 10 or 11 years old. Very destructive. Um I did destroy the living room carpet um, in an attempt to make soap. Saponification is quite difficult without the right equipment, but never never mind. So from, from, from an early age, I was obsessed with chemistry. And the, the beauty of the periodic table is it's a human creation that aspires to understand everything that the universe is made of. Everything is in, in, this, in this periodic table. And if you know how to read it, for each element, you, you will know immediately how many neutrons there are, how many protons, how many electrons. You'll know its properties from where it is on a row or, 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 or a column. And the beauty of it, of it is that when it was first um, conceived over 200 years ago by Mendeleev, although other people had looked at it, and all he, under, all he had was, a, was weights, atomic weights. That's all he had. Mm -hmm. But he started putting in play, uh, the elements in where he thought they would fit. And there were gaps. And the beauty is that the, the predictions of elements being in those gaps, they were all discovered. So not only was it conceived in trying to understand the, all the elements on, in the universe, it, it, had a, it had a predictive power from its very conception. And, and I look at that and think it's, so amazingly beautiful that that could happen. And because I'm a vice chancellor of a university that likes to build things and we build a massive new science building, I have the ability to indulge myself. So when, the, when this new building was built, I said, I would like the largest permanent periodic table in the world on the side of the building. Now the previous, um, largest permanent periodic table in the world was in Spain. And I didn't want to be 10% bigger. I wanted it to be four times bigger. 
and the previous largest periodic table in the world, which they did for me. You can, if you stand by it, one of the squares representing an element is as big as a person. And across the road from that, on a little green space, looking at the periodic table, we built a picnic table of a periodic table. So you can eat off the trans transition elements and you can sit on the lanthanide and actinides. That's what the chairs built of. Mm -hmm. And so you're sitting on a periodic table table, looking at the world's largest periodic table. And that is an indulgence, but it's quite a beautiful one. But does that also represent how you've navigated the world? Think big, translate, find out, <laughs> where, find, find out where there are, are gaps and opportunities, and then take advantage of those? Uh, well, I think uh, that you've hit on a good point there. Uh, if you're going to do something, are you going to have a vision? Then the vision has to be, to be, it has to be a big one. You have to make a big change. So when I left the University of Edinburgh, where I was the deputy vice chancellor, become the vice chancellor of Harriet Watt, one of the th well, we did several things. I think that yeah, you know, I would say were massive projects. One was to open a new campus in Putrajaya, which is the administrative capital of of um, Malaysia. Uh, that was that was huge, but also to get the National Centre for Sport in Scotland, which is based at, on Harriet Watt campus. So, you know, all the national rugby team, national football team all train there. And also to steal the um, a British Geological Survey, which was based in Edinburgh University and get it to transfer over to Harriet Watt University. So these were big things. But whilst I like the big thing, because I think it changes the dynamic of what how people see a university so the big thing here of course is the 800 million dollar campus i'm building in the or we are building in the in the center of perth right which we crafted and started and designed and delivered and, and obviously it's being constructed now you can go and see all the cranes working away that was also delivered in the middle of you know a pandemic so th these are things, I, I, I kind of got a little bit of a Shackleton complex, you know, that, that, you, that you, if you're going to do it, it's got to be big. And if you if you don't quite get that, then just change the mission to something else. Um, uh, and so I think that the city campus will change people's perceptions of ECU. But I don't lose sight of why ECU is what it is. And why it is what it is, is because it has a great culture. It has fantastic quality of experience for students, the number one public university in Australia for student experience, the number one public university in Australia for teaching quality. So I don't lose those things. Those things have to stay. But building that new campus and when it opens will change the power dynamics of, of a higher education in Western Australia. I have no doubt about that. So how do you account for that culture? And it's a culture of excellence. It's a culture of uh, responding to community and student needs. So where, where does that come from? Because you're, you're absolutely right. You, you are number one in those areas. I, I think in terms of well, the last time, we do staff surveys every two years, which I think are linked really to the way the students perceive things because the staff surveys are also very good. And the last one we, we did, not this one, but the one before it, we got the voice survey um, award for the best the best staff results, as it were. We were, like, we were 20 points ahead on certain areas. And I, I, I think about why that might be the case and why we are so collegiate. During the pandemic, we, 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 I wouldn't say we had, anybody had a good pandemic, but we, you know, we didn't have to go to any forced separations of staff. We had some voluntary things. But, and that was because the staff kind of, it was a bit like you know, you're on a ship, everyone's got their jobs, and then you hit a storm. And everybody has to just work all the time with a single vision of getting the ship through the storm to calmer waters. And if you've got a cohesive group, it's quite easy to do that because no one, no one doesn't want the, the thing to succeed. There's no, there's no back chatters going on there. And I think that links to the fact that the we get such good results in the st student surveys is because when a staff member from ECU goes into give them a tutorial or a lab, or when they go and visit a professional staff member, those people really care about the outcome. 
right? Mm -hmm. That outcome, that interaction with that student, let's say it's a professional service person or an academic, might be the only serious outcome, uh, the only serious encounter you have with that person, right? And for you, you might have, have seven of those that day, but that was still got to be the special one. That person's got to walk away and say, that was great. I had a really good experience there. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you're probably in the wrong job. So that, that seems to me, you've got the, the culture resolved and you've got the values right. So what's, what's the culture like at ECU for you able to do, to, to get that response from staff and students, which is remarkable? Well, look, the culture was great before I came, so I'm not taking any credit for the culture being, um, being brilliant. A culture is lots of people. I think what the, what the leader of any organization doing, you can look at Shackleton there, right? I mean, he left most of his, of his, of his people trapped on Elephant Island, sailed to, to South Georgia, walked across the interior of the island, which had never been done before, with just two of his people, Right, 800 miles he sailed in a rowing boat in the Antarctic Ocean, got there, tried to rescue his, his team. I think it was the fourth attempt that they did that they got them. And he saved every single one. And they all kept their morale up because he had that amazing ability of, OK, the ship's been trapped in the ice. It's crushed. Our ambition of going to the, North, to the South Pole is now not going to happen. We have a new mission to demonstrate that we can survive and it'll still be an amazing adventure to tell the world about. And, you, you know, you, I think that's what the leader does. The leader doesn't create the culture. Those guys would, would tight, they were cohesive, but the leader's got to make sure the morale stays there. And if you hit a barrier like a pandemic that you get through, and I think in, in the situation with something like the pandemic, the, the biggest thing we did was never shy away from telling the staff what the honest truth of the situation with the university was, just being absolutely open. Communicating regularly, but only when you had something to say. Uh, and, you know, having uh, as much access as you could to staff and asking them to do some incredible things. Like, you know, normally if we were going to do an online course and we said we'd like an online course and they'd say, oh, it'll take six months and half a million dollars, you know, having to say to them, how about three weeks and no dollars? Now, it's never going to be as good because you don't have all, but you, you get there, you do it. And it did, it, it did. We got there. We, it, it happened. So um, that was a meandering way of, of trying to ex answer your question, but I think it got there. Oh, and, and it did. And it, it showed the importance of fortitude and grit. Absolutely. Resilience. Yep is if you don't have resilience and you hit something like a pan I mean, when the pandemic starts, you don't know what the consequences are, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't, you, your ship's feeling like it's being crushed, but you don't know what's going to happen. But you then war game, how many staff are we going to have to lose? How are we going to be able to keep the, all of those things? And you make small decisions. Like I kept all the cafes open on campus. Sometimes they sold five coffees. It, it, that was, it's economic nonsense to do that. But it's good for morale. People know, well, if I'm in there, there's a coffee shop open, right? Now, coffee's quite important in the modern world, and it makes a statement. Um, so, so we did things like that. They, they're not all keeping the e-lab open at all times, no matter what, because some of our students you know, are from challenged backgrounds. They may not have good internet connection, or they may have siblings who shout a lot, or parents who interrupt them. They need a safe space to go and get their education. And if that's taken away and you've got the problems of the pandemic, it can be devastating for them. So if we can just divert the conversation to your education, mm. and if you could talk to us about your experience as an undergraduate student and as a PhD student, and I read that you studied at Newcastle. I did. I, uh, well, I'm, I'm Newcastle born and bred. But I, we moved away to the to the actually the Lake District, a beautiful part of England, in a tiny village called Amberside. It was absolutely I gorgeous. know that. Yes. There you go. But the the um and I applied to all sorts of the universities. I went down for an interview to Oxford, etc. But the lure because I we moved when I was kind of ten, eleven, and the idea of getting back to what I thought was my Geordie roots was was a very strong 
pull. So um, I applied for chemistry, obviously, got accepted, and I went. I just had a fabulous time, an absolutely fabulous time. As from a working class family, it's the classic cliches first in family to go to a university, it's all of that stuff. Um, not certain, you know, of my value, my worth. And, and, and this happened, this is why ECU is so great. That experience transformed my aspirations in life, my, the way I looked at life. And it was just such a fabulous, fabulous time. I know people say the best times of your life, but looking back, I just loved the subject. I loved to, I loved being in the labs. I um, had a good social life. Newcastle's a cheap city. What could you not want? You know, I could go marching against the current government with placards. <laughs> it, 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 we were much more politically active then than I see now, which is an interesting change. But I had a great time. And, my, and what, when I was there, I became... As a chemist, I became very interested in the chemistry biology interface. And in particular, I, I love transition metals, but how they could be, how their properties could be twisted and molded if they were in the middle of a protein scaffold. They could do amazing things that they couldn't do as a separate metal. I wanted to do a PhD in that. So I did a PhD in that with a, with a guy called Jeff Sykes. Met so he he had a lab that was quite big and was like a United Nations. So there were people from everywhere, including an Australian, who actually I remember it was the um, that test match, the Botham test match, and he he gave me ten to one odds that that England would lose, and I took him, and he had to pay up, which was nice. <laughs> but that's an aside. Um, so I had a wonderful undergraduate and a wonderful PhD uh, position, and during that, you know, I was I spoke to my supervisor, and he said, well what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to one of the best labs in the world. And I want to stun what are the biggest problems in inorganic biology, which at the time was nitrogenase, the nitrogen fixing enzyme. I mean, imagine that you take nitrogen, a triply bonded molecule and at room temperature, right? At normal pressure, you can make ammonia out of it. We would take thousands of degrees, massive catalysts, and huge amounts of energy to do it if, as humans, but this protein could do it very easily. So that, that to me, and I got a NATO scholarship to go to MIT, which is not a bad institution. Yeah, I believe that's, you know, it's up there. Well, unfortunately for me, my wife, we got married just before we went off to the States. She went to Harvard and she used to tell me it, I was like going to the TAFE down, down the road. So one, one of the things I've always enjoyed is, is working with chemists and engineers because they're great problem solvers. And so how can you, how do you take that sort of ability to identify complex issues and complex problems and not simplify them, but to pull them apart so that you actually understand the possibilities of those and translate that into a sort of your, your management and leadership style? Yeah, that's a, that's a really a really good question. And I do think the training, I, I mean, I don't use the curriculum I got as a chemist. I don't need to worry about, you know, what the reaction temperature should be or anything. But but the, 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 the way that you approach your hypothesis for the experiment and what you're going to do to test that hypothesis, because in that career as a chemist, I found myself changing. I wanted to solve the problem, but the things you needed to do to solve the problem changed. So for example, I wanted to understand how the, how the enzyme say reacted. Do that, you can use all kinds of wonderful kit, stopped flow, different types of, of, of reaction dynamics. But then I wanted to understand the structure. So I had to be, do some protein crystallography to do that. And then I wanted to manipulate the enzyme because I got, a, I got really incredibly excited with the molecular biology revolution. Like you could manipulate the DNA and change an amino acid in the middle of a protein, maybe the ligand of the metal or something like that. You could actually, and then make a new protein with different properties. But then you, I had to learn molecular biology. So I, I found myself retraining each time because the things I needed to do to solve the problem, to take it to the next phase, needed a different skill set. And I think what that taught me was to be incredibly flexible in the way that you 
handle that. But what I learned was that whilst you can do that, when you have the luxury of being the researcher, the hands-on person, when you get into a leadership position, you can't do all of that, right? You have to. And so I think if I've done any, if I was to say, what's the proudest thing I have at ECU, it actually wouldn't be the city campus. It wouldn't be my wonderful periodic table. It would be the executive team I've created around me. Because the the deputy vice chancellor for ed, for education can do that job much better than I can. The deputy vice chancellor for student equity and diversity and indigenous affairs can do that job much better than I can, etc. My vice president corporate, my chief finance officer, and so I just let them do it. But so rather than retrain myself and take control of everything, I just say. That person's better than me. I don't need to retrain. I just say the scale of the project is how do we convince government to give us half a billion dollars to build this, right? What do we need to do to do it? I can't do all of that, but I've got all the people that that can do it. So I've, I, I mean, we all think this is vice chancellors, but you know, I, I think I've got a premiership team. Oh, and I know a number of those people, and you have a fabulous team. I but that, that, that speaks to what you're able to attract, but also it speaks to your ability to help grow the confidence and capabilities of, the, of your team. Uh, well, I think I find that easy. And the key thing for it, just one word, trust. If you, invis- if you invest trust in someone, say, look, we need to get this, whatever it is, dollars, or we need to get this change made, or we need to get this change management thing done or we need a new way of doing stuff and I trust you to deliver that I'm not going to interfere just go away and select your own team deliver it uh and and they if if people feel trusted especially by by the kind of leader they want to repay that trust they don't want to let you down they're going to work every hour to deliver for you if you don't trust them if you look over their shoulder when they're on the computer and say well i wouldn't have done that i would do i would have done it that way then they'll constantly come back to you and say should i do this but i don't want them to do that because i know they're better at it than me so why would i ask them to do that now in the end of course um i sign the contract and get the flowers so why wouldn't i want to do that i started off indicating that you'd been the vice chancellor of two different universities a scottish university uh, and uh, an Australian university in the West. And of course, those of us that live in the, in the East just see the West as being another country. It, it pretty well is. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with, with that sort of stepping back, what reflections can you have on higher education as it is at the moment from two quite, I mean, there's similar sorts of universities in terms of their, um, uh, their, their sort of historical location in the community. But what, what reflections can you have about higher education and reimagining it? They, they are similar in many ways, but there also are significant differences, which I think have helped me in many ways to, in reflection, to understand why they have, the, how they work. So Harriet Watt began as a mechanics institute. So, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, skilled people were required for things that were developing, like we are now with the tech revolution. And um, they needed institutions, not teaching theology and philosophy, but but mechanics, right? Engineering wasn't called that at the time, but, um, and so basically it's it's the first lecture actually ever given at Harriet, what was on ke- in chemistry, which is a side, an aside that you, you might be interested in. But anyway, the, the people went to that university after they'd done their jobs to learn and to become skilled so that they could get a better job in the industrial revolution. So it, w- it was built in the heart of the working class. It wasn't an elite, and, and, and ECU is like that as well, but, but it, from a different route, it came up through education, through the, edu- the schools of education, as it were. Um, and that university, because of its origins, had very little, it had science, it had technology, it had engineering, it had business. It didn't really have arts 
of any kind. It was what, what in Germany they'd call a technical university, like the Technical University of Berlin or whatever. And that was great because I was a scientist and, and I had a wonderful time there. And basically, I, I could probably have run any of the schools except the business school and you know that 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 that, that end of things it, but coming to her to ecu was a revelation because we have a very large school of arts and humanities and we have the western australian academy of performing arts so you know i was then exposed to things like journalism visual arts uh, a screen academy a performing academy and i could go at 7.30 every evening to watch an opera or a musical or, a, or Shakespeare. And so it took me right out of my comfort zone because I'm kind of almost, pardon for using the word, I'm almost in research terms, the scientific method Taliban, as it were. You know, that, that's my grounding. That's my training. That's what I, how I see the world. And then for somebody, you know, I'd say to somebody, oh, yeah, what are you doing? They say, oh, I'm a PhD. All oh, right. I said, what's your, you know, what's your thesis? What's your, what's your area of research? I said, jazz. Oh, I said, what? so you're going to be a doctor of jazz, which sounds fabulous. I mean, uh, who wouldn't want to be a doctor of jazz? But it, it was hard for me to grasp the concept. So what theory do you put forward? What hypothesis? What tests, do, what experiments do you do to challenge your, your theory to, uh, and it doesn't work that way in arts and humanities. Now, I found that both scary and exhilarating at the same time um, because, they, I mean, I think it stretches the word research, if I might use that, beyond my narrow definition of it. But uh, that, that, so those two things were, were very different. And, but I do think you're right in terms of the server community, right? They, we are a quality access university. Um, we, we take great students, but we, we take students who maybe, I think you know this, Judith, that in Western Australia, we have an abysmal number of students that do ATAR. I mean, it's about 30%. What about the other 70%? Are you telling me they're not smart kids? But they go to a school that doesn't even offer ATAR. So we have a fantastic enabling pathway um, called UniPrep. It's not easy. It's not a soft way of getting into university. Of the people that do it, only 60% pass. But those that do and come in have a better success record in terms of retention than some who've just scraped in through, through ATOR. So I think that's what I want to do, though, right? I was the working class kid, and I got transformed. By it. and I want to. I see kids like that, you know. And uh, 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 to indulge myself, I have given first year, only first year, chemistry lectures because I like talking about atomic and molecular structure, because I like to give them all. I, I think I find the best way of someone to absorb something is that you tell them something that is so incredible, so almost unbelievable, but true, obviously, that they never forget it. It's just that. Wow! I never thought of the world in that way. I mean, take Avogadro's number, for example, right? You know what that is. Uh, the old definition was um, a mole, you know, so, and, the, and it was defined at 12 grams of carbon. Carbon has the atomic number 12, obviously, because it's got, uh, uh, in 12 grams of uh, uh, carbon, you have an atomic number of atoms, right? Which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. That's a huge number. So I say to them, well, imagine the, the earth, but imagine it was just flat, but it's the same size as the Earth. You've got a big Earth, it's flat, and I have some marbles, and I, I layer them all around the marble. How thick would the layer of marbles be if I had an Avogadro's number of marbles? 10 to the 23 is a big number. And they say, well, 10 meters, a meter, three miles. <laughs> three miles. Now, when you tell them that, they go, can't, I can't be right, because they don't realize 10 to the 23, if you think about the population of the, of the earth, 8 billion people, you would need 100 trillion times the population of the earth to get an Avogadro's number of people. My, it's just a huge number. And, and, but there's that many atoms in 12 grams of carbon. Now, those are the sort of things I think I like to do my, my kind of because I want them to be awed by the natural world. I want them to think, wow, and they want to know more then. 
And there's all kinds of things. I mean, if you get into the quantum world, you can just blow their mind. So uh, I'm not sure why I'm telling you this, Judith. I think I've lost track of things. No, well, well you're telling it because it's the power of communication and oh. the ability as, as a teacher to be able to connect with students' hearts and minds, but to challenge them. And so you did all of that. Well, I, I just I just love to see it in their eyes, you know, just to just, uh, is he kidding me? Or I also do them, I say, I, I take in a, um, an orange, I say, imagine this orange is the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So it's just a proton and that's the size of it. How far could the electron be away and still in the atom? And the answer is June Lup railway station, which is quite a few, yep. quite a, a way away. And then they think, oh, but, well, that means that most of, because everything's made of atoms, so every, most of the world is space. Yeah, but, but remember, the atoms tiny, even though that's the relative difference between them, and the, the electron travels close to the speed of light, so it's everywhere all at once. If you think, if you think of a tiny space and it's traveling, it's not traveling at the speed of light, obviously can't, but it, it's, it's sub-speed of light, maybe a third of the speed of light, whatever, so it's everywhere, so it is solid if you actually think about it in that way. And then they think, wow, how could the, this, this orange is there and the, ele and the electron, which I say is the head of a pin, is out at June Lup Station. Now those are, are all kind of weird ways of looking at the world. Um, and I just find them, well, actually, I, I, th I don't think I, in, I, I was taught like this. I was taught like this about the awesome power and, and, and of nature and, and, and how chemistry is the mechanism. You can understand that. Power. I know the physicists would claim they're better than than we are, but they're just they're just chemists who can't do experiments. <laughs> <laughs> so if if we sort of get back to um, the context of reimagining higher education. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, I lost that. No, 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 no. There's, 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 I, I'm I'm having a good time. I know you are too. Um, what what do you what what do you see the short term and the longer term challenges? facing both the sector and your institution? Right. So we, we the, the first thing I'll say is, and, and it's kind of, and I know we have modern technology, we do all kinds of wonderful things in, in higher education now, but if you went 850, 900 years ago, and you went to the University of Bologna, you'd find things going on, which was the first, at least Western university, you would find things going on that are recognizably happening now. And that's because if you ask students, the, the richest experience they get is direct contact with an academic. Being able to ask the questions that you can't ask a YouTube video or a, you know, a panopter lecture. And so I, 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 and I accept that there are people in remote areas that can do great online courses and I have no doubt about that. But the rich experience, you know, the experience you're going to get at an Oxford, a Cambridge, a Caltech, a Stanford, are going to be rubbing shoulders with brilliant minds, physically being in the same room with them. And that will always be the apex, in my opinion, of what higher education should be. But higher education is not what it was when it started in Bologna now, because, of course, as you know, as it developed, it became in, involved in training for the professions. Nursing, for example, never used to be a university course. It is now. Now, I know why people come to be a nurse, and it's a great thing to be. But there are people who come to university to do philosophy or medieval history, not with the idea of doing a job, but because they want to explore a part of the world with their mind. And, and my fear is that we lose that aspect of the of the university culture and, and we became, we become feeders. I think I detect in Australia maybe more than I detect in Europe, a drive towards that, as, you know, with certain governments, a drive towards that, well, why is this valuable to the economy, right? Why should we do that? Well, it's not very valuable to the economy. We don't think you're gonna get a good job. So we're gonna, the fees are gonna go up by 113%. And I wonder about that because you can go into some of the greatest firms in the world, banks, uh, the big the big four houses, you know, KPMG, et cetera. There'll be a guy with a medieval history degree in there, right? Because his mind works in a brilliant way. Um, and yes, 
all of the teachers will get good jobs and be good teachers, etc. But so I think that's the first thing I'd say. I, I, I do think we have to be careful we don't lose the 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 creative thinking area of the university to to just being a production that the that the government wants us to do to produce. We have a shortage of X, make them. It isn't what I think the original ethos of a university should, was. But look, things have happened. Technology is, is, is racing. We will soon have chat GPT-4 out, uh, which is, so artificial intelligence is going to revolutionize things just as, you know, when, when the first calculator came out and schools thought we better ban it, otherwise no one will know how to use a slide rule. No one needs to use a slide rule. So it was fine doing. So we have to see that chat GPT is not the issue. The issue is integrity, academic integrity, not chat GPT. It's just the next tool. And in fact, it's a great tool. I've used it. You know, it's great at generating lists of important things. You go, oh, I forgot about that for my list. So, so I think it'll become a, a tool used by corporations and everybody else. And you, are, you as a student are going to need to know and how to work with artificial intelligence. And providing you acknowledge that you've done that. Well, no one asks you anymore that paper that you sent in. Did you use spell checker? Well, of course I use spell checker. It's on all the time. It, but we don't think that that's cheating, do we? We don't think you're a bad speller. You should demonstrate your, of course we don't. And, and I think the same thing will happen here. So there'll be a technical revolution and, and technical revolutions have continually changed that. And uh, But I think the thing about universities is we've always adapted to it. We've always been able to use it, to absorb it and become, and just become an, something else. You know, MOOCs, oh, we'll never need to build a residence ever again because students won't want to go to either, just do MOOCs. Well, there's lots of MOOCs. They're perfectly good, but people still come to university. My coffee shops are still filled. People want to come in. They want to meet other students. They want to meet academics. And then, of course, there 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 is a big worry. I think about about the tension between being a public university and being in receipt of immense public funds, which is a, a, a you know a privilege to be able to have that that resource. And we should use it while, well, and we should honor the fact that it's the taxpayer that is allowing us to do many of the things we do. But at the same time, trying to convince the taxpayer and government that actually we will be much more useful to you, to your community, to the things we'll create, if you let us get on and do our job and don't interfere. And I think, you know, like breaking the Haldane principle of, of saying, well, everybody else might think that's a good grant, but I don't because I don't like the title, so you're not doing it. If you look at the uh, the OECD table of you know how good universities are and how how much they achieve, the more more interference you get from government, the less creative and open they are, and we can see that in in you know in in dictatorships, right? That, you're told how you have to think, or, or even if we go to an extreme of, say, Afghanistan, where you can't even educate women. I mean, we don't want, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be accountable. Don't get me wrong there. But our job is to turn out the next generation of leaders, your doctor, your IT expert, your tax consultant, and all of that sort of stuff. And at the same time, to have new research coming along. And we can do that. And you'll get the best outcome from it if you don't interfere too much. I do have fears about that. And of course, the, the kind of almost collapse of what is truth. Now, as a as a scientist, you know, I know I know what the definition of an element is. And, and no one's going to tell me it isn't that. And I know that because lots and lots of different people have done experiments to try and See that that's not the case, but we do have, I think, a, a, a kind of in in the general public, a maybe a maybe it's I don't know whether it's a crisis, but and universities have to correct that. We have to show them the way, and we can't do that tethered. So we're starting to run out of time, and I'm aware that your your diary is pretty packed. So two last questions: um, What advice would you give to your younger self? And then, and then the second question, what advice would you give to aspiring senior leaders? The advice I'd give, I'd give to myself, because I had, when I went, when I first went to university, you know, I never even thought, well, it's university for me, maybe I should just go to college. You know, I, I didn't, as a working class kid, not knowing about it. 
I would say to my younger self, just stick with it. Do what you want, and you're going to have a fabulous life. That's what I would say. Two aspiring leaders, I would say, you're going to, you're going to have a lot of challenges facing you. But don't fear them. Overcome them. And don't fear failure. If you, if you never failed, you've never had a proper experience, right? So you're going to have the setbacks. The question isn't that you're going to have the setbacks. That's not the issue. That is going to happen. The question is, how will you respond, right? So there you are. You're Shackleton. You're stuck on an ice flow. What do you do? You could just sit on the ice, be a passive victim and say, it's too big. I can't face it. Or you could try. So I would advise them, if you persist, perseverance overcomes resistance. If you persevere, you will get where you want to go. That would be my advice. And what a fabulous way to end what it, for me has been the most engaging and enjoyable conversation. So Steve Chapman, thank you for giving me 45 minutes of your time today. You've made my day. Well, thank you, Judith. I've enjoyed it entirely. And I'm sure I've talked a load of what on most of it. But thank not you. At all. Not at all. Visit studiosity.com slash students first for the next Students First Symposium, an open forum for faculty, staff and academics to candidly discuss and progress the issues that matter most in higher education.